and literally he said like, I can't understand why this is offensive. I'm just, I don't know what I, I am doing. I'm just doing it. Just drilling and where are you from? Where are you really from? And they don't stop until I say, my father is from Morocco. She just grabbed my, grabbed my hand. And I actually say help once time. And she ignored me and she even laughed at me. I might not have been born in Denmark, but I call this my home. My name is Ellie Joker. I'm 40 years old. I live in Denmark, Copenhagen, and I work with satire, and I debate a lot um, in Denmark. I am a black American and I am away from home. Um, a lot of times I feel a bit stuck and a bit useless here. So for me, it felt a bit like, okay, if I can't help there, like maybe I could see like what's up in my surroundings, essentially. My name is Javon. I'm 27 years old and I'm originally from New York. I am a musician and community organizer. I came to Denmark when I was three years old. I came as a refugee from Iran with my parents. So we were some of the first uh, Persian families to enter Denmark. I moved to Denmark in 2016. Um, I originally moved to Aarhus and I was there for two years. And then when I graduated from Aarhus University in 2018, I moved down to Copenhagen. Especially being a student there, I was the only black person that I really saw on a day-to-day -day basis in my collegiate. And just kind of the stuff that I dealt with when I was there, it made me very aware of my blackness and very aware of my alienation. And when I came down to Copenhagen, I was like, oh my God, there's people like me around. I don't have to hide myself. I don't feel pressure to straighten my hair or to like, you know, do all that type of stuff. There's this dreaded question that I'm always asked, the where are you from <laughs> and where are you really from? Um, my roommate recently like put it into, I think, rather good like words, because she said, you can tell that you're not white, but you're, you also can't tell which shade of brown. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't mad at her because we're close and we were openly talking about it. I was encouraging that dialogue, but it stuck with me. I was like, and I like caught myself looking in the mirror and was like, yeah, not white, like Danish people are white, but I'm also not brown like my father is. And just this weird cafe latte in between that no one knows where it's from. One of the things that makes Denmark a super interesting case country is that Denmark on the one hand has a a national narrative and a self-understanding, or is that this being a country where this kind of thing doesn't happen, we don't have racism. If you kind of know you're doing it, you hide it. In a country like Denmark, because you didn't think you were doing it, it wasn't very hidden, so it was really easy to study. My name is Mira Skadegard, and I'm a researcher at the University of Aalborg in Copenhagen, and I primarily work with what we call structural discrimination, and that includes racism. Language is an excellent place to look at how discrimination happens because it's structure. It's a, um, a way in which we communicate how we see the world. This is how we make our us and thems, how we define Danishness and non-Danishness through language. So when we talk about the non-Western immigrant, for example, that's a way of hiding, talking directly about race, talking about whiteness without saying whiteness. The assumption that Danish, the way we use the word Danish to describe white Danes and the way we use the word invandra or second or third or fourth generation invandra to describe anything that's non-white. So these are all ways in which race is embedded in our language and in our norms and in the ways in which we talk. He was trying to mix Chinese and Koreans. Like for example, he said annyeong and sometimes ni hao and sometimes some Chinese word. Recently, I tried to explain that thing to him. Your behavior, like mixing Chinese and Korean, that can be disrespectful to another culture, because that means 
I don't care about what you guys thinking. I'm just doing it for fun. And literally he said like, I can't understand why this is offensive. I'm just, I don't know what I am doing. I'm just doing it. If someone speak Danish and Spanish and German is, if someone mix it, I will just, I will be okay. Like that kind of attitude. This is my studio. Um, this is where I come to do music, and I'm also here today with my brothers from the Munta Collective, where we're planning for our show on the 27th. It's me and three of my friends. Um, all of us are R&B musicians, but all of us are in our different R&B type of bag. All four of us just got along really well so. from the moment that we met each other. And since we're like, okay, we have a similar musical scope, let's like try to get together. And it's from like a really sibling type of type of energy, basically. I remember taking a particular interest in singing when I was around 13. Music for me is emotion, basically. Um, I feel like every musical output is an expression of emotion. The emotional vulnerability sometimes resonates with people. For me, it's just when it comes to a person's self-image, it's really important to see yourself reflected in the media. I think especially for, for black people, um, we need to be represented in all aspects. We're not a monolith. And I think one thing about the mainstream media everywhere is that it presents us as a monolith. When it comes to just me being a socially awkward black girl talking about my feelings and being sad in front of people, I feel like that it's not that it will end racism, but it can kind of contribute to what I was talking about, about black people not being a monolith. Because black people were so good at being confident and stuff, but that confidence and strength sometimes hides a lot of pain. And it's nice for me to kind of be able to show that type of pain and softness and stuff to show that it is okay, you know? Comedy has been one of the most important uh, tools for me to communicate. You and I will communicate differently if we laugh instead of like yelling and being you know, like offensive or built in a fear of each other. A lot of the stuff that I do in my work, while I show, it's still blurry, uh, the pink taxi, whatever I do, I try as much as possible to do a change. I don't just do reality shows. I like to make people think. I like to give people different perceptions of what life can look like. Laughter is one of the best ways for us to hopefully get closer to each other and learn more about each other. Fear gives us distance. Laughter brings us together. And they have swimming pool and everything. You have to remove, you have been kind of legged before you go to the bathroom to clean. Um, I was kind of shy because that wasn't my culture. I didn't remove all my clothes in once. I kind of removed my top at the beginning and then I washed myself and then I thought I'm done. I'm supposed to walk into the swimming area and then have one really old lady. She just grabbed my, grabbed my hand and she was like, you're not allowed to go in. You have to remove, you have to wash yourself again. I was like, I did and then I don't know what to do. And then she grabbed my hand really hard and I can't even remove her hand or like push her away because she just like get really mad even shouting of me. And it's like kind of like grab my hand and move me to the bathroom, like the shower area again, shower head again. Yeah, and then he asked two of her lady friends come over, both the similar age. And then they told me that I have to remove, yeah, I have to remove my bikini and the bottom. So I have to be fully legging in front of them to shower on myself until they feel like I'm ready. They even kind of lean down, you know, the body, just close look of my lady park, just to be sure that I have cleaned it up. And during that time, half one Danish lady, she got in and she didn't remove every of her swimming wear. And those lady didn't bar on them, you know, they just let her in. And I actually say help once time and she ignored me and she even laughed at me. I still hear they're speaking Danish about like 
foreigner, blah, blah, blah. I, I didn't know it. I was almost crying. Then when I get into swimming pool, I, I can't really stay for long because I really don't feel comfortable anymore. Yeah. And then after that, that was like several years ago. I think it's happened perhaps 2015. And until now, 2020, I'm still have the fear. Every year, the National Police comes up with a report on how many registered hate crimes we see in Denmark. And it's always between, is it like maybe 450 and five to 550 cases. But then we have other examinations, uh, actually from the Minister of Justice, that l looks into whether if you've been a victim of violence, do you feel that uh, the motivation for the violence that you experienced was due to your race, ethnicity, religion, etc. And that number is way higher. My name is Nana Margrethe Koso and I'm a chief consultant here at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. And my main area of expertise is equality and discrimination with a focus on ethnicity and race. That when we talk about hate crimes in Denmark, we see that people, they don't file a complaint with the police. But we also see some of the cases where it has been filed a complaint, there's been an investigation, and it goes before the court. It's actually really difficult to prove that the motivation for the crime was because of the victim's ethnicity, etc. I usually drive the pink taxi minimum once, once a week. For me, the most important thing in the pink taxi is basically that you talk to people, different stories, different beliefs. And this is where you can actually have that conversation. You can share your opinions. You can have a discussion, a debate. I think it's really important to have this type of representation in the media because it shows all the different kinds of people we have in a society. A society, just because you're ethnical Dane, does not mean you're a racist. I don't believe that all Danes are racist, and I don't believe that all Muslims or minorities are extremists or want to kill all Danes. Yes, I'm going to pick up a guest. Hi, John. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Get in. Yeah. Ooh, I see some women here. Yeah. <laughs> what would be your take on um, working with racism in Denmark? How could we try to remove mm -hmm. or, you know, like... Yeah. I think people need to stop, you know, the fact that there's so many thousands and thousands of people that showed up to the Black Lives Matter marches in June, which mm. is amazing. But when it came to that man being murdered and born home, where was the outrage? Yeah. And then that was like, you know, 10 days later, that was when that poll came out about people not thinking that there's racism. So I think they need to kind of realize that when people are working against racism, it's not working against white people and stuff. Mm. Because there are so many allies who are white who are also actively anti-racist yeah. too. Usually people have a tendency of judging um, the color of your skin, yeah. the religion that you come from, mm -hmm. and all the outside things, you know, like are covered. Yeah. Instead of finding out, like, who are you? What's mm -hmm. your name? Exactly. You know, like, what do you do? What do you like? What do you not like? Yeah. And people are just too you know fed up with their own shit yeah that they forget that behind you there is actually a yeah. human being well two some tap for you there <laughs> give us a lift thank you yes and i look forward to looking at your stuff also too likewise
of the things that are missing in the conversation of racism in Denmark is basically including the people that we're talking about. What needs to change is sort of on several different levels. Things need to change at a structural level, at a political level, at a institutional level, and at the individual level. And these things have to happen together. So we need political leadership that actually prioritizes this problem. So denial needs to stop. And we just need to acknowledge it happens like it happens all over the world. But maybe prioritizing it would be the simplest way to put it. I think there are, of course, uh, things that has to change in, in, in different levels. That the government makes an action plan to combat racism and hate crimes in Denmark. Have more black friends, you know. Um, be exposed to black stories. If you live in a small town where there aren't black people, follow black people on social media and see what they're saying and stuff like that. Don't follow people who are just imitating our culture. Follow the creators of the culture.